audience. Uh, today, we will be talking about personal statements and how to write a killer personal sp statement specifically. Now, just as a slight sort of background, uh, I've read literally thousands of personal statements because I've been involved with admissions at Oxford University for about a decade or so. So I do have a lot of experience of reading personal statements. But of course, I'm used to reading personal statements that are focused on social sciences and humanities subjects because I'm a politics tutor. And I'm also used to people writing personal statements for the benefit of Oxford. So my advice will be relevant to all uh, research intensive universities, but it is advice based on my personal reflections. So please do solicit advice from various sources. This is not gonna be the final word on how to write a really powerful personal statement. So just be clear on that. Okay, anyway, I'm gonna share my screen so you can see my presentation. <clears throat> Okay, so write a killer personal statement. Now, should you wish to look at these slides later, or now indeed, uh, if you go to this website, tinyurl.com forward slash UOO, as in University of Oxford PS personal statement, then you'll find them there. So tinyurl.com forward slash University of Oxford personal statement. Okay, and let's get started. Now, just as a just to sort of keep it visually entertaining, I provided pictures, photographs, courtesy of the wonderful Wikipedia, from all 24 of the so-called Russell Group universities. Uh, that's because these 24 universities have a very similar approach to personal statements. They're looking for answers to three questions that I'll outline in a second. But please be very careful with the Russell Group uh, brand because it's a self-selecting brand. In other words, participant universities pay a subscription to be members of that group and that doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be the best universities for you depending on what you'd like to study where you'd like to study and so forth there are for example many fantastic universities that are not that don't come under the russell group umbrella so for example the university of swansea the university of aberystwyth the university of reading the university of leicester fantastic world-class universities with very strong strength, with great strength in certain fields, but not in the Russell Group. And the advice I'm going to give today would apply to those universities just as well. The key point that the Russell Group have in common is that they are research intensive universities. They predominantly offer academic degrees. So that means that your personal statement needs to be tilted towards the interests of an academic, not the interests of someone who is preparing you for a more vocational course. So that's why I'm generalizing for the Russell Group predominantly today. But please be clear that this idea that the Russell Group are the good universities and anything else is somehow a poor uh, alternative is simply false. And it depends on what works best for you, what the best university is in your ranking. Don't get too het up by rankings produced by university, by uh, newspapers, etc. Anyway, how to get started. So you need in your personal statement to answer the following three questions in 4,000 characters. So you don't have a great deal of space and that's what you need to try and sort of get across. What is your motivation for applying to this particular course or courses? What evidence do you have for this motivation? What do you, do you know what you're getting yourself in for by applying to this particular degree program? Okay, so let me just go through all of those in turn. I should note that I've, I've provided the images of the Russell Group universities in alphabetical order. So we're starting with the, uh, with the lovely University of Birmingham right here. So first of all, um, if you're applying for an academic degree, you need to express as such in your motivations for applying to the course. In other words, you need to tilt the wording of your personal statement to academic matters not vocational matters. So I'm gonna give you some examples of, if you like, do's and don'ts. So A is an example of what would not be so effective and B is an example of what would be more effective. So A, I have wanted to be uh, become a doctor for as long as I can remember. I recall visiting my GP as a child and being transfixed by their power, okay? Now, the issue with A is that it's not talking about academic matters. It's talking solely about vocation. Now, there's no harm in talking to vocation. There's no harm in expressing your, your ambitions for the future. But bear in mind that the, the horizons of an admissions tutor at a university are much closer than that. They are interested in who can do this course, this course which is highly academic, and who's going to take that opportunity and run with it and do the best with it. Yes, it can give them some confidence if you say, I'm, a, I'm motivated to become X in the future, a doctor, a lawyer, a banker, whatever. 
But predominantly, they're concerned about can you hit the ground running from day one? So they're more interested in your academic interests. And so B does a much better job. How does aspirin relieve pain? My interest in medical sciences began as a child with a sore knee. Recently, I've researched aspirin to uncover the magic of acetosalicylic acid. Okay, um, so why is B better? Well, in both cases, they talk about childhood uh, sort of, uh, creation, origins of an interest in medicine. And some people worry that you can't talk about, well, I've been interested in this subject for years because it's a bit of a cliche, but it's not a problematic cliche. Personal statements are little short biographies. They're explanations of you and what you're interested in. So if you happen to have developed an interest as a child, that's fine, it's useful to know. At the same time, it's not required. I think a lot of people think that we are looking for someone who's had at least a decade's worth of yearning for a particular subject in order to be serious contender. And that's not the case. So don't feel the need to have some sort of long standing obsession with a particular subject because most people don't have that. So it wouldn't be realistic. Um, but if you do have that, it's also it's not going to do you any harm to speak about it and to speak honestly about what dragged you in to the subject. But don't forget, focus on the academic interest. So where B uh, does that, B talks about how the, the chemistry of aspirin, aspirin being derived from willow bark and how this you know, person reflected on the really fascinating biochemical science that connects a particular drug to a particular outcome. And you can see that this is someone who's not just thinking about, well, one day I will become a doctor, but they're thinking about when I start my medical degree, I'm gonna be doing some really fascinating, intense and difficult science, medical science. So hopefully you can see the difference. A is too much focused on the very long term. B is much more focused on the immediate term. And that's what uh, admissions tutors will be interested in as well. Okay, evidence, right now, this is an image of the fantastic University of Bristol, which is where I did my first degree. Uh, and the key point with evidence is that you ought to show, don't just tell. Now, what I mean by that is you must provide proof. Most personal statements will sound a little bit like a love letter from a feckless husband. In other words, they'll tell their lover, oh, I love you dearly, I'll do anything for you, but they don't provide any proof of that. So this is a husband that cheats, perennially on his long suffering partner who never actually substantiates the claims of being in love with his with his wife. This is perhaps a bit of a tortured metaphor, but the point I'm getting at is that talk is cheap, very, very cheap. It's easy to say that you love medicine, law, archeology, span pharmacology, whatever. You need to prove it. Don't just say it. Now I know I'm getting a little bit agitated here. That's because I've seen this literally hundreds and hundreds of times is a young person with fantastic potential who just says proclaims this wondrous desire to study a particular subject but they don't have a shred of proof that they have actually got that interest and that's not good enough the universities will not take you seriously unless you have some evidence so here's some examples so a Studying law will give me superpowers. I'm endlessly fascinated by how legal disputes arise, are taken through court and ultimately settled. I could read court cases happily on Christmas Day. Now that is cheap talk. Prove it. Don't just say you've done these things, prove it. And B proves it. I am applying to study law because I'm fascinated by how legal professionals trade in language. The 2015 UK Supreme Court, that's UKSC, case of Hotak versus LB Southwark, London Borough Southwark, turned on the interpretation of vulnerable, which Parliament had left deliberately vague. Now, the difference between A and B is that B is communicating their fascination with the law, but without actually having to just say so. You know how much you can communicate your your desire, your motivations without actually having to explicitly say, I am fascinated. You can tell someone that you've done this reading, this research, and that will communicate your fascination without it needing to be explicitly stated. OK, so hopefully that uh, difference is clear. All right. Um, so getting back to it. All right. So next up, we've got the University of Cambridge. Uh, and the point here is, do you know what you're getting yourself in for? Can you communicate in your personal statement that you get what a degree in the subject entails? Now, that means you need to do some research into what the course entails, what sort of learning, what sort of resources you're likely to encounter from day one. A good example of this is that 
if students talk about academic texts that they've read, then that's a good sign because they know that they're going to have to read academic style works from the from the get go. So that means academic journal articles. That means academic books. What's not impressive is, is, is if someone reads an introductory text to their course and proclaims that on their personal statement, because anyone can read an introductory text. But you've got to be able to read and engage critically with academic works. So if, for example, you're applying for medicine, don't just tell us that you've read popular science works because anyone could read those. Tell us that you're reading The Lancet. Tell us that you're reading the BMJ. Tell us that you're reading the latest research to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. Make sure that the the uh, the level of reading is the same level that you would have to read from day one of your degree. And all of a sudden, your admissions tutor is going to feel a lot more comfortable. OK, this is someone that gets it. They know what it's going to take to do this course and to do it well from the get go. Now, here's some examples of uh, do's and don'ts uh, with regard to the study of Arabic. So A says, learning to speak Arabic will allow me to communicate with people living throughout North Africa and the Middle East. That's fine. It's true. But that is a tiny slice of what a degree in Arabic or indeed any modern languages degree provides. And B gets it much better. B says studying Arabic will allow me to see the world differently through an ancient culture and rich literary heritage. I am particularly keen to study Islamic architecture. Now, a is too fixated on the language part of the modern languages. B realizes that the language is just a tool to understand the culture. Languages degrees typically are broader than just studying a language. And so you need to reflect that ambition, that desire to study the gamut, not just the particular focus. OK, so make it clear from your personal statement that you know what you're getting yourself in for. Right. So if you're applying for medicine, you need to talk about top journals. If you're applying for a degree with multiple facets to it, you need to give some sense that you get what those different facets are. OK, so, for example, with Arabic, you're not just learning a language, you're learning about a whole culture and history and literature and architecture and all sorts of other things. OK, so uh, let's uh, move on. Um, put the personal into personal statements. Now, most personal statements are surprisingly impersonal. In other words, they don't really tell us that much about you as an individual, which is a real shame because we're trying to get to know you. We, this is a little bit like an interview committed to paper where you're trying to sort of give us key data on you as a person. And we're trying to calculate, well, should we offer your place or should we not? And that makes it quite sad if the personal statement actually doesn't reflect you very well. And is you trying to hide behind other people? That would be akin to going into a, to an interview. And rather than answering the questions authentically for yourself, you answer them the way someone else might. But then that kind of defeats the point of an interview. So make sure that your personal statement is personal. Now, what do I mean specifically by that? Well, here we start off with uh, the University of Cardiff. Um, and one thing is that I'm often asked is whether or not you should quote people. Now, you can quote someone, but a quote is by definition impersonal. It's someone else's words. So you can you can only quote, I would say, if you're going to use that quote to better express yourself. Don't quote someone just to show off some stuff, you know, because frankly, it's not impressive. You can find quotes these days within milliseconds on Google. So knowing quotes is not in the least bit impressive. Using quotes is a different story. But if you're going to use quotes, bear in mind that you're going to use up your own characters, allowing someone else to speak on your behalf. So it better be worth it. Anyway, A is an example of how not to do it. If, if all the economists were laid end to end, they wouldn't reach a conclusion. I entirely agree with this. That's impersonal. That's a bit like going to an interview and saying, well, I'm not going to answer, but I'm going to allow someone else to answer for me. It's not good enough. B is better. If all the economists were laid end to end, they would not reach a conclusion. I'm not troubled by this. Economics, like any science, must not pretend to unearth absolute truth. So B is reflecting on the quote, is analysing the quote, is adding some value to the quote, is not just passively putting the quote down and allowing it to speak on their behalf. That's the key difference. OK, so don't let your personal statement become impersonal. All right. Next up, we've got a picture of the University of Durham. Uh, speak like yourself. A lot of people adopt some sort of bizarre, flowery vernacular that they think all academics speak 
uh, which we don't. And we'd much rather that you just communicated clearly and precisely rather than trying to use exaggerated, I don't know, elocution. Right. So A is an example of what not to do. The art of medicine consists of amusing the patient whilst nature cures the disease. Quote Voltaire. I unalterably concur with this vaulting sentiment. Advances in medical sciences have merely extended our capacity to amuse. Oh. And it's just difficult to comprehend what the author's trying to say because they're using such long, pompous words. It's really not necessary. You're not being tested on your vocabulary. You're being tested on whether or not you are motivated to apply, what you've done to provide evidence for those motivations and whether you know what you're getting yourself in for. That, that's what you're being judged on in a good personal statement. Not, does this person have an enormous dictionary in their bedroom? Okay. Um, B does it better. The art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. This is broadly true, but I would not describe the use of a bedside manner as art. There is plenty of science to it. So in the case of B, they're just using words of two syllables and it's fine. It's clear. It's easy to understand. It's it's perfectly acceptable. So don't think that you need to have sort of multi-syllabic, complicated jargon to get it to get your meaning across. If you if you want to use technical jargon, that's fine. But again, use it to express a, a genuine personal connection to the subject that you want to study. But don't just throw it in there as, a, as some sort of bomb that sort of shows off how much stuff you know, because frankly, that's not impressive. OK, uh, next we've got the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and the point for this slide is that we want you to be quite self-reflective. If you want your personal statement to elevate itself to being truly personal, you need to tell us about your reflections on what you've done. What did you think, in other words, when you read something, when you watched something, when you listened to something, when you experienced something, what did you take away from that? What did you feel when you did that? That's the sort of thing that elevates a personal statement. Now, please don't worry if your thoughts on what you've done are a little bit half formed, because obviously we're not admitting students that are already perfect academics. Otherwise, there'd be no point in you coming to learn with us. So. You know, we are expecting you to be trying out ideas and to be a little bit unconfident in what you're saying, because that's just normal. But what we don't want is someone who's not even willing to try, who's not even willing to share with us their reflections on what they read, who just reads things and sort of says, oh, that's probably right. And just agrees with everything because they're not thinking for themselves. They're not developing the critical thinking that we're looking for. And please be clear that critical thinking is not just the domain of the sciences, the social sciences and humanities. Natural scientists also look for critical thinking because science is a contestable domain of inquiry. So the idea that someone would just credulously agree with everything that a particular scientist has said will mean that they don't really get what science is. So that would be very alarming to admissions tutor. So try and reflect on what you've done. Don't just give us a big shopping list of, of stuff you've read. Tell us what you thought about what you read. OK, so here's some example. A. Uh, E.H. Carr's What is History opened my eyes to the relativism of historical facts. I will never read a history book the same again. OK, passive, not speaking for themselves, just saying I read this book and it told me what to do and I followed it. B. E.H. Carr's What is History stresses the relativism of historical facts. This is an important contribution, but would render history little more than unscientific fiction. I would argue that history, like any science, seeks facts, but only has partial access to them. So I've read Carr and here's what I thought about it. Not I've read Carr, the end. Most personal statements just tell us they've read, just the, the author just tells us they've read stuff as if that's impressive, but it isn't. What's impressive is someone who reads things and thinks about them and reflects on them. So if that means you read less, but you think about it more deeply, great, do that. We're not looking for a big, uh, quantity of reading. We're looking for quality of reading. So pick things that are going to stretch you, pick things that are academic, that will show that you know what you're getting yourself in for with an academic degree, but that you then give yourself an opportunity to think about, reflect upon, and, and consider for yourself, because you are going to contribute to these debates from the day, the, the very day you get to university. So you have to start trying now, okay? But don't worry if you're not entirely confident in what you say, because that will come. All right. Uh, so 
Um, next is structure. How can you structure your personal statement? Oh, it's fairly straightforward. There just needs to be some sort of beginning, middle and end. Um, what often happens is that there is just sort of the, the authors just sort of jump around. It's a bit of a stream of consciousness. It's like reading a Virginia Woolf novel that you're not entirely sure what's going to come up next. And you don't need to overstructure your essays. They don't need to be sort of really rigidly split and segmented into components. But just giving some sort of degree of a story, excuse me, story arc would be helpful. Pardon. So starting off with the University of Exeter here. So think about how to hook your readers, okay? How to sort of help them understand the full uh, personal statement. So some fairly basic uh, open uh, ways to achieve this would be to, of course, be clear and make sure your language is easy to understand. So it's a good idea to make, to allow someone to read it who's not from your, from your background, not from your discipline, so that to see if they can just get what you're trying to say. You could use bookending, which is a very straightforward way of making sure that your personal statement coheres. In other words, you start and you finish with one particular theme or one particular device. So you might, if you recall, when I spoke about the medical student talking about getting a sore knee and getting interested in pain relief, you could finish off with that somehow, sort of link it in, and then it provides a degree of coherence to the whole piece. You need to sort of develop a case for admission. So you're trying to make it clear to your readers that you deserve the place above other people that you're competing with. Now, I'll give you a bit more detail on how you might want to do that in a second. And you want to make sure you answer the three questions that I outlined at the start. What's your motivation for applying? What have you done to provide evidence for that motivation? And do you know what you're getting yourself in for? So you need to answer those questions. You don't need to do so explicitly. You don't need to sort of say, I am motivated to apply for this. I have evidence for this and so forth. Your, the way you frame your experiences, when you, the way you discuss them, will answer those questions tacitly. Um, and that's what you need to try and achieve. Okay. So here's the University of Glasgow, and we can talk a little bit about a logical progression. So a structure that very straightforwardly just helps your readers go from the beginning to the end to make sense of what you're trying to say. So you're telling a bit of a story, a very brief story about yourself. And a classic sort of story technique is a sort of climb the mountain technique. So you start in the foothills and you summit the top by the end. And so the way that metaphor works is that when you're starting the story, you're talking about the origins of your interest, how you sort of ex you started to explore around the subject and got interested in it. So in the case of the medical student, they started to gather their interest because of a sore knee and the powerful impact of aspirin on their pain relief. And then you could start to work through various different parts of the subject, the discipline of medical sciences in order to build up the case that you deserve to be admitted. So you could talk about the substance, what do medical scientists study? You know, they study pharmacology, uh, physiology, uh, palliative care, uh, practical medicinal techniques and so forth. Um, then you could link that into the methods. So substance and method is a classic progression of thought. So not only what do we study, but how do we study it would be an interesting thing to talk about. Then your findings, what did you take away from some reading you've done, from some experiences you've had? And then you can finish with other interests you have, which I'll get on to talk about in a minute. So it doesn't have to be this particular structure, but something that just sort of tells a story that allows your readers to climb the mountain with you. I started with this little sort of kernel of an interest, and this is how it developed up and up and up. Okay. Um, what will be read now? The, uh, sorry, this is the um, this is Imperial College London, I should say. Um, what is actually going to be read? Well, your admissions tutors are going to have hundreds and hundreds of personal statements to read. So you need to sympathise with your readers. They will be tired because they will be doing all of their other jobs at the same time as assessing your application. So you need to help them. You need to hold their hand, help them extract the data they're looking for. They want to extract that data. They want to be able to say this is a candidate that fits our criteria and that we ought to select. But you need to make it easy for them. So, you know, be realistic when you're producing your personal statement. Make sure that you answer the three questions I've mentioned. Make sure that your answers are clear and accessible. And make sure that the structure is such that someone can read it quickly and get the meaning with ease. Don't write something convoluted and complicated with no structure because the readers would probably not give you as much of a benefit of the doubt as you might hope. Okay. All right. 
So what's next? <clears throat> um, so extracurricular activities right now. And this is an image of King's College London. Um, so how important uh, are non-academic activities? Now, in the case of Oxford and Cambridge, they are not important in the slightest. We don't make admissions decisions on them whatsoever. So regardless of how much you're doing outside the classroom that is non-academic, I'm afraid it, it won't make a difference. We do not make academic, we do not admit people to those universities on that basis ever. And the Russell Group universities are pretty much the same on that particular point because they're ultimately offering places for academic courses. So whether or not you're good at sport, music or drama is irrelevant to that. Uh, some universities, however, do look to see someone who can manage their time, who can work cooperatively with others and so forth. But for most of the universities that I've been uh, talking about today, the Russell Group, they are pretty narrowly interested in your academic ability and your academic potential. So if you don't have a huge, impressive list of extracurricular activities, frankly, that's fine. OK, but, you know, there are various ways that you can use your extracurriculars more or less efficiently. So here's what not to do is to just provide a passive shopping list of stuff that you've done with the hope that that speaks for itself. So I am head girl. I've played hockey at county level. I've just obtained my Duke of Edinburgh Gold Award. I'm grade five in flute and grade seven in piano. Now, I should know I've written all of these. So this is not cut and paste from some poor uh, head girl's <laughs> personal statement. Um, but it's a very representative of the sort of things that we read a lot. Now, obviously, these are very, very impressive achievements. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to take that away from this person. But it doesn't help me answer the question, does this person have the academic ability and potential to be worthy of a place at my institution? There's no, she's not helping me out. She's not helping me understand why any of this is relevant. Um, she's just sort of assuming that I'm going to be impressed by these things, which I am, but it's still not relevant. So this is a better way of doing it is just to leverage it, to make it clear how your extracurricular activities actually do have some academic relevance, which they almost certainly will. So um, it was actually whilst obtaining my Duke of Edinburgh Award that I first experienced sustained geological fieldwork. It was so affirming to hunt for evidence of the world's very formation. So imagine this is a person applying for geology or earth sciences. They are making it clear how the stuff they did outside the classroom actually reinforced their desire, their motivation to study this academic discipline. And you can do that with pretty much anything. So imagine you're applying for physics and you play a musical instrument. You can talk about the physics of sound. Imagine you're a medical student. And you do a lot of sport. You can talk about sports injuries. You know, just help us out. Make those links from the non-academic to the academic. And all of the universities we're talking about here on the, of the Russell Group will be much more interested in that. OK, supercurricular activities. Now, this is the University of Leeds. Um, what counts as an experience? So a supercurricular activity is something that is academically relevant, but takes you outside of your A-level syllabus. And that can be pretty much anything. It can be reading. It can be listening to podcasts. It can be watching lectures on YouTube. It can be having work experience of various uh, kinds. Um, so don't feel that it, supercurricular experiences have to be quite elaborate work experiences. They can be, but they don't have to be. And we would not judge someone as a stronger candidate purely on the basis that they have an impressive list of work experiences, because frankly, they are not equally obtainable. You know, if someone happens to be lucky enough to live next door to a high court judge and they're applying for law and they've shadowed that said judge on multiple occasions, well, that's just luck. That's not because they are a better candidate. So do think fairly openly about what a supercurricular experience is, because we will as well. We're looking for people that are self-guided because when you start a degree, you will have to do quite a lot of work on your own. You'll have to identify some of the aspects of a problem and try and research them yourself. And so someone who's already tried that out on something that they're interested in, that's what we're looking for. That's the sort of person that's self-guided, independent-minded, and they can just hit the ground running from day one. So those are the sort of experiences that we're looking for. Anyway, here's an example of what not to say. I've not had many opportunities in life. I want to become a doctor, but no one I know has been to university and a GP shadowing placement planned for the summer was cancelled because of COVID-19. I nonetheless want to make sure my children have some of the opportunities I did not have. Now, this is an example of someone using emotional blackmail to try and get their way. And it's not a good idea because we will have lots of information about someone's relative disadvantages on their personal statement. We'll know, for example, if they've come out of 
care. We'll know if they are from one of the poorest parts of the country. We'll know if they've had any difficulties with their schooling. We'll know if they've got any disabilities. Now, by all means, you can tell us some more of that data in your personal statement, but don't use it as an excuse because there will be a long line of other candidates who will have had similarly difficult backgrounds who won't be making excuses. They'll say, well, I've had these difficulties, but here's what I've done nonetheless. So don't sort of say, I've got difficulties and therefore I've not done much. Say, if you like, I've got difficulties, but here's what I've been, been able to do nonetheless. That would be much more powerful. OK, uh, so here's an example of what would be better. A GP shadowing placement planned for the summer was cancelled because of COVID-19. Instead, I took a free online course on epidemiology to understand the pandemic better. This led me to volunteer delivering medicines in my community. Through this, I observed firsthand the difficulties in public communication of virus suppression advice. Now, this is another example of someone who's using an experience to leverage an academic point. They're not just saying, I volunteered delivering medicines. They're saying how that got them face to face with an academic puzzle. How do scientists communicate the importance of virus suppression and mitigation? That is an academic question. And they're really sort of highlighting the link between their experience and the academic value of that. OK, so that's a much better approach to this. OK. Um, oh, sorry, which university was that? Did I tell you? Yes, Leeds did. OK, here's the University of Liverpool. So uh, what if you're applying to different degrees at different universities, which is not uncommon at all, especially if those university degrees are quite sui generic, such as, say, natural sciences at Cambridge, which is a compound degree that you don't find at every university, or philosophy, politics and economics, or PPE at Oxford? Well, basically, you need to extract the common denominator subject. So here's what not to do. Uh, philosophy, politics and economics, PPE is the perfect combination of subjects for me. Or natural, scientists, natural sciences has the multidisciplinary flexibility that will allow me to solve problems of the future like climate change. Now, the problem with that is that any university that does not offer those courses will just reject you immediately. If they see that you uh, are writing a personal statement for PPE, for example, but they don't offer that degree, then they just have an excuse to instantly chuck your application in the bin. You don't need to mention PP if, for example, you're applying to politics degrees at every other university. Oxford's not going to mind you not referring to that particular degree program because we know that other universities don't offer it. So here's a better approach. Social sciences being the study of human coordination appeals strongly to me. My specific desire to pursue a degree in the distribution of power in a society was triggered by a bad summer job working with a tyrannical boss. I observed his behavior and considered how tyranny begins on a micro scale and can expand to the scale of a country. Now, in this case, they're not saying I want to study PPE, they're saying I want to study power. And that's basically what most of the courses in PPE do. And also any politics degree or po politics and economics degree elsewhere in the country would do that as well. So that would be fine. So just find that common denominator and talk about that. OK, here is the London School of Economics. So how do you stand out? I'm often asked um, and in a good way, not in a bad way. Uh, well, here's what not to do. And I've read this. I'm afraid this this is pretty close to a direct quote. Uh, my father's dying wish was to see me attend university as the first person in my family to ever do so. Now, there's no question this was memorable when I read it, but it was memorable for for the wrong reasons. Again, it's emotional blackmail. It's someone who's not giving us evidence of their academic motivations. They're just trying to pull at our heartstrings. Now, I felt sorry for the person that wrote this because, you know, obviously, you know, they, they've had uh, a bereavement and they've also been very poorly advised as to how to write a personal statement. So it was memorable, but it wasn't memorable in a good way. Better to stand out because of your originality, your flair, your interest, your verve. Basically, all of the advice I've given so far would would make you stand out. But you know, just make it clear who you are, what you're interested in and what you've done about it. So, for example, in pursuit of my interest in anthropology, I've researched the phenom phenomenon of the dying wish. It appears that wishing for a legacy is hardwired with examples of mortality facing declamations from the early, earliest archaeological sources, particularly in Egypt. So, you know, I'm, I'm riffing on the notion of a death wish, uh, which was mentioned in the last one to bad effect, to showing how you can talk about the very phenomenon of a dying wish, because in itself, that is a fascinating academic puzzle. Why do people have these deathbed wishes? What, why, you know, animals don't, as far as we know, care about their legacy. So what is it about human beings? So anyway, that's a way to sort of stand out in a better way, because you're showing inquisitiveness. 
Now, language is important, but I'll rattle through this fairly quickly, starting off at the University of Manchester. Spelling. Use British in English if you're applying to British universities. So that means organized with an S, not with a Z, color with a U, for example. Um, be careful with homophones. So those are words that sound the same but mean something different. So program without an ME on the end refers to a computer program. Program with an ME on the end re refers to what we mean by program, say, a program of study. So just be careful with that distinction. Uh, be careful with technical terms and especially their different national spellings. So etiology is the British English way of, of spelling that word. Etiology is the American English way. Estrogen and estrogen, again, British versus American approaches. Avoid apostrophes. It's do not, not don't, would not, not won't, etc. Um, punctuation, here's the University of Newcastle. Uh, keep sentences short, please, for goodness sake. Some people have sentences that run on for four or five lines, which is just desperately difficult to understand. Don't forget, your readers are tired and overstretched. So if they're reading very long sentences, they will give up, I'm afraid, and they will just dismiss your application. Don't misuse semicolons. Semicolons are meant to be used for bulleting points, but they're almost always misused in order to just make this huge compound sentence. But usually you can replace them with a full stop, and it does everyone uh, a greater benefit. Uh, please note the difference between an M dash, which is in brackets there, is a long dash and a hyphen. Quite a lot of people use an, a hyphen when they're meant to be using an M dash as a form of punctuation. This may sound desperately pedantic, but academics are desperately pedantic, so you better play the game. <laughs> okay. Uh, grammar. Um, this is the University of Nottingham. Uh, be careful with will and shall. If you're not sure how to use those, please look up the usage. There are usage patterns. There's no strict sort of absolute iron rules, but there are differences between I will and I shall, which may be worth uh, checking up on. Be careful with syntax and subordinating clauses. Specifically, always make it clear who's kicking whom. In other words, in your sentence, you need to make it very easy for the readers to understand the subject, the object, and the verb. If subject, object, and verb are split up by subordinate clauses and very complicated syntax, your meaning will be lost in the model. So just avoid that. Be efficient with your language. Avoid overusing adjectives and adverbs. You know, you don't need to say that you're very interested. You can just say you're interested. You don't need to say you're endlessly fascinated. You can just say you're fascinated. Um, you can save a lot of character space if you cut out pretty much every adjective and every adverb. OK, um, so I have uh, run out of slides, but I've still got seven universities to show you. So um, because there are 24 Russell Group universities. So here's Oxford. Uh, this is the um, Queen Mary University of London. Uh, this is uh, Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, this is the University of Sheffield. This is the University of Southampton. Uh, this is University College London. Uh, this is Warwick University. And this is the University of York. OK, and that leads me on to conclusions. So um, first of all, make sure your personal statement is personal. I know that sounds kind of trite and annoying, but it's really useful advice, I think, because most people's personal statements are not personal. And by most people, I do mean a majority, a comfortable majority of people write personal statements that don't tell us sufficient information about that person. Get some feedback, but know when to stop. You could show your, your draft personal statements to everyone you've ever met, but that would be a waste of time and you'll get different uh, points from everyone. So be careful when seeking feedback not to overdo it. And bear in mind that the marginal benefit of multiple drafts of your personal statement is probably not as great as the marginal benefit of practicing, say, an admissions test. Admissions tests, regardless of which university you're applying for, have a much greater impact on your chances of getting in than the personal statement does. So be careful, don't spend loads of time preparing for your personal statement. But having said all of that, it is useful to prepare for your personal statement because it makes you better for interviews because then you've got stuff to talk about. You can reflect on stuff you've read and you can, you can provide some flesh to the bones of your conversations. So the personal statement should be well prepared, but when it comes to actually writing the thing, don't overdo it because it won't add an enormous amount of value if you draft and redraft and redraft and redraft. And finally, evidence, evidence, evidence. Don't just tell someone, show them. Don't just say you're interested in law, anthropology, Arabic, Japanese, engineering. 
give some proof. You must provide some evidence. If you don't, it will be the easiest two minutes that an admissions tutor has reading your personal statement. They will just discard it because they will think this is not a serious contender. I've got a huge pile of people who not only say that they're interested in engineering, they've done something about it. They've read some stuff, they've experienced some things, they've listened to some lectures, they've watched some uh, online tutorials, whatever, they've proved it. You must, must, must provide some proof, okay? Don't just tell, you must show. And the reason I'm getting so animated is because I care about the outcome of your applications and it pains me to see someone who's obviously a strong contender throw it away by not giving sufficient proof of their motivation. Okay, so that's that. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, the slides, as I say, are available at tinyurl.com forward slash U-O-O-P-S. Uh, that's tinyurl.com forward slash U-O-O-P-S. Um, I will stop sharing my screen now um, and see if there's any questions, but you've got to go off to various other lectures shortly, so I won't uh, talk for too long. Okay. Um, so I'll answer one of the questions and then I'll start, I'll write answers, longer answers to these so you can look them up a bit later. Um, so do I need to start my personal statement with a really good opener or is it okay to say I want to study X because blah? Um, well, I guess it depends on what a really good opener is. <laughs> um, but I would have thought that just a fairly honest opening where you say I want to study X because is completely fine. So I'm not going to think less of you if your opening is pretty straightforward. Um, you don't need to sort of punch me in the gut from the very get-go. Um, so I wouldn't overthink the opening. I think that's something that a lot of people do is that they feel they need to come up with some sort of overture at the start that grips the readers, but it's not necessary. I mean, to give you a concrete example, there was one personal statement I read where the author said, I'm going to not use the letter E at all in this entire personal statement in reference to a, a short novel from the early 20th century. And I just thought, what? Why? <laughs> Why would you do that? It's not, it's not impressive. It's not necessary. Uh, you're standing out, but not for a particularly sort of constructive reason. Um, so in short, I would keep it simple. Just explain what you want to do. And then you can build more impact in the main body of the personal statement when you tell us what your reflections on your uh, readings were. Because that's when it'll suddenly elevate it to a truly personal statement, I would argue. Anyway, I better stop wittering because you've got other stuff to get to. But thank you so much for watching. Uh, do keep the questions coming. I'm going to spend uh, a bit of time now answering them. So if you've got any that have not been answered, then do feel free to type them up and I'll get to them as soon as possible. But I hope you're staying safe and well and uh, I'll speak to you shortly. Thanks, everyone. Dioch.